Welcome back into the original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hey, Jimmy. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. And uh, we got our uh, producer extraordinaire, Benny Augusta, behind the glass on the ones and twos on the wheels of steel. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we've been on a kind of a historical retrospective kick um, in some of our uh, more recent episodes here at the OG, and we're going to uh, stay on that, you know, on, on that same pathway today. We're going to discuss uh, the 30 year anniversary of the uh, Philly Mafia War, the Philadelphia Mafia War between uh, Skinny Joey Merlino, who is the current. Uh, boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. He took over 30 years ago via the war that we're going to discuss um, when, as a young 30-year-old, him and his uh, crew of, of boyhood pals and, uh, you know, equally ambitious and um, power-minded young men decided— young Turks. young Turks. decided to take on the old-school Sicilian Don, John Stampha, uh, who had backing from the New York families in a, you know, all-out— a slugfest for for power in the in the Philadelphia North Jersey rackets. The uh, war started in '92, lasted till '94, and ended with John Stanford going to prison and Joey Merlino uh, taking over the crime family. And he continues to hold the reins for the Bruno Scarfo crime family today in 2022. We've talked about him a lot. He's you know by far the most compelling modern day mafia figure in America. He exudes swagger. And uh, just a, uh, a X factor, I think, when, when you're talking about studying these type of people, he, he jumps off the page or jumps off the, uh, the mic or, 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 or the video screen and uh, just really is a, uh, a lot of ways he's a throwback. But at the same time, he's the quintessential 21st century gangster because he is what I've uh, what I've coined. He is the Instagram Don. Uh, got onto social media uh, in the last decade and has really embraced it as, as his organization. So they're, they're outliers in that regard. Yeah. He's very comfortable in the public spotlight. I mean, I, I suspect he doesn't like people talking about his affiliations with the organized crime, but otherwise he likes to be on the front page. He likes to be. I think there. he likes people talking about what a big bad gangster he is. Yeah, I mean, probably, I yeah. think, on the surface, he's going to give lip service to the, uh, you know, I'm just, a, uh, you know, a guy from the street corner and I'm just a gambler and, yeah. a, uh, you know, a, a, a knock around guy. I'm not, right. I'm not a, a mafia boss. Um, but I think he likes people thinking and knowing he's a mafia boss. I mean, that, it's what, that's currency for him. No, for sure. And he yeah, he's I think he's what a lot of people who maybe don't have extensive knowledge of the Italian mafia. If you were to ask them what they picture in their mind, it's probably Joey Merlino. Yeah. Even though a lot of guys, if not most guys, are not like that, <laughs> I think that's what a lot of people imagine. Yeah, he you know, he, he looks the role. He looks you know, the part. He famously says crime don't pay, meaning he doesn't pay for anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, lives his life on everyone else's dime and uh, lives a very gaudy, um, sensational Almost like, a, uh, you know, if there was a male version of the Real Housewives of, of uh, L.A. or New York, uh, it's yes. like Joey would be the lead character. Uh, he is uh, riveting and compelling, and um, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by him, but I'm also not someone who's going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to tell it like it is. I'm not going to um, make excuses for him like there are people in the media that, oh, that, yeah. that are uh, more uh, kind of water boys for Joey than um, than actual journalists or researchers or historians that are going to give it de give it to you, uh, you know, straight down the middle. You know, he is he um, I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but it's an interesting point that he they have this war and he actually wins. Because a lot of the time, the person who's launching this offensive to have this coup, they don't win. Vicarina, most most of the time, they don't. It doesn't or doesn't right. work, right? And so it's really interesting that not only a that it worked, and b such a young group of guys. Yeah, and it's really remarkable. And Joey, uh, and and then we're gonna double back, but you know, Joey tells people or has told people 
um, kind of famously that uh, he has the devil on his shoulder and that the, the devil is there looking out for him. And, that, and, and that's his explanation for why he has been so lucky uh, when it comes to not ever being convicted or arrested or I shouldn't say arrested, having never been convicted of any major, major um, violent crimes, has uh, been convicted on racketeering, but uh, although he's a suspect in you know, murders that, that go up into the double digits, uh, has never been convicted of a murder. Uh, he has averted over a dozen assassination attempts um, and has come out unscathed. Only one time was he actually wounded in one of those attacks, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and he's sitting here at 60 years old and he's been playing with house money for three decades. And uh, like, and, and in the nineties and today, it's not like it was in the twenties or thirties where young guys were running crime families. I mean, starting in the, I would say in the fifties, sixties, I mean, most of the bosses yeah. were, were guys that were either middle-aged or, or elderly. Yeah. And, and Joey at 30 years old. Like you said, he he uh, launched this uh, offensive, this palace coup, um, and kind of a combination of circumstances of of uh, him having uh, the balls and the vision to do w- what he did, and then the fact that John Stampha, who was his um, enemy, you know, his rival, uh, w- wasn't someone that was very well liked. He wasn't popular. He, he, had, he did not have the pulse of the streets. There was a disconnect between him and a lot of his organization. And, and Joey and his guys uh, leveraged that. He was always seen as an interloper, right? Because yeah. he wasn't, he didn't grow up, he was a Sicilian guy. But he never, you know, some Sicilian guys come over and they are able to integrate into and immerse themselves into the, the local brigada. It always seems like it always seemed like he was uh, had more of an outsider. Uh, well, he was placed. Stature. He was placed in yes. Philadelphia right. or in New Jersey by the Gambinos right. when he came over here uh, in the mid seventies. You know, there were rumors that he was made on the other side, made in Sicily, and uh, came over here uh, through the Gambino crime family, specifically through the Cherry Hill Gambinos, and was you know placed with Angelo Bruno, who at the time was the the longtime Philadelphia Godfather, and uh, and and Stanford was assigned to him, so he wasn't someone that had any history or roots in the North Jersey or Philadelphia area. He shows up in the mid seventies as a guy that at the time was, I mean, he was speaking broken English in yeah, in the nineties. I can imagine what right. it was like when he first uh, got over here, and uh, yeah, he he was viewed as a kind of a carpetbagger or or an interloper, and he never really ingratiated himself with most of the rank and file. And by the time he took over, which was, you know, a void being created because Nicky Scarfo and that whole 1980s um, bloodthirsty regime uh, all went to prison in, in about 87. And then there was an acting boss between 87 and 90, which was Nicky Scarfo's uncle, Tony Buck Piccolo. And in, the, in around 1990, the New York, what what's left of the commission, uh, the Gambinos and the Genovese, give the family to John Stanfa. And uh, th- I think we're going to start now uh, with with doing a little bit of a deep dive. And, and as I said off, off uh, air, we, you know, we pride ourselves here at the OG that we're not just going to tell you uh, great, fascinating um, stories that, that have historical significance and and really, you know, grab you with a lot of razzle dazzle because we're gonna we're gonna always give you that. But we're also gonna kind of dig in the crates, if you will, and, and and go into some nooks and crannies of narratives that a lot of people have heard or know about. But we found these kind of uh, th- this lens into that same narrative uh, about aspects of it that maybe you didn't know about, and probably deep tracks. Did, yeah, deep tracks, probably stuff that you didn't know about. B sides. So as we go back and, and do a 30-year retrospective of, of this you know, pivotal time in, in the American underworld, especially, obviously, in, in Philadelphia and North Jersey, um, I wanted to find an, an entry point to emphasize that maybe 
people didn't know about. So everybody knows about the war. Uh, everybody knows that there was a, a two-year shooting war between Merlino and Stanfo. But how did it really start? What was the the first domino to fall? What was the 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 match that lit uh, the 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 match that lit the fuse that became this five alarm fire of a of a mob war. Well, let me, let me. I just want to back up for a second and ask you about Stamfa. Um. So when Bruno is killed, he's the driver. So Andrew Bruno was mur murdered in eighty March, 80, of, March of nineteen eighty, and John Stamfa, the night of Bruno's assassination, uh, and that was a palace coup. Yeah. From his own conciliary. Yeah. Uh, that Bananas. was that was unsuccessful. And uh, John Stanford was involved in the conspiracy. Wasn't his nickname Tony Bananas? Tony Bananas Caponegro, who yeah. uh, ran Newark uh, for the Philly crime family. Oh, yeah. He was a North Jersey guy. Yeah. And uh, had become Angelo Bruno's conciliary in 1977 after Bruno's conciliary for the previous 10, 15 years, uh, Joe Regnetta passed away. And... I think Bruno decided on Caponegro because Caponegro was a street guy. Mm. And uh, Bruno, at that point, right. was, was kind of in that Paul Castellano yeah. uh, mode where he was very removed yeah. from... What they call him, the Gentleman Don or something the, like the that. Docile Don. The Docile Don, right. Uh, and, and he was someone that uh, didn't, have, didn't give a lot of face time to his soldiers. No. Um, was living more isolated and he had his inner circle of guys that he trusted but uh wasn't really a man of the people caponegro was someone that was a, a street guy but was also um i mean he was insane <laughs> that's what they call him tony bananas yeah and uh he wasn't happy there was a lot of people that weren't happy with how angelo bruno was running that family um guys that had nothing to do with the conspiracy to murder him but were happy yeah. when he was murdered because they weren't fans of his as soldiers and uh, i think nikki scarfo was one of those people i don't think i know and there's a famous photo of angelo bruno after he was murdered he had his head blown off uh sitting in his car outside of his row house in, in south philly it does say something that he stayed in in a row house in south philly he never yeah. moved out to the suburbs and, and uh bought a mansion like right. buck castellano did or Stanford lived in the or, suburbs right, of right. South Jersey too. But the last uh, image of him was, his, you know, his mouth agape, yeah, uh, with his head blown off. And uh, I know Nikki Scarfo was telling people that that the the image was appropriate that his mouth was open because Andrew Boone was trying to eat off everybody else's plate. Well, he wouldn't. He he. It seemed like he was. Uh, conceding too much to the Gambinos in Atlantic City yeah. and in the drug right. trade. And uh, it's interesting you point out that Bruno would, would not have very much face time with the rank and file. But we know he would hold court with the Cherry Hill Gambinos all the time. And so that didn't that doesn't go over well with the rank and yeah. file when you'll break bread with the Sicilian imports from a New York family, but not and he didn't want, with your own guys. He didn't want to make guys uh, because he was worried about cooperators and uh so the family dipped um you know he made guys in the in the 60s but in the 70s angelo bruno stopped infusing the family with new blood yeah and uh just developed this reputation that he was running the family from a distance without actually being far away from the family uh, yeah detached yeah it seemed like uh it was more about minimizing his own risk Exposure, yeah. as opposed to uh, running a family yeah. and uh, taking a, lots of, and taking lots of money from the drug trade while telling his men that they can't deal drugs. Yes, Martirano was one of his right. top earners, and everyone knew he was a PCP and meth guy. Kingpin, I mean, kingpin, yeah, drug he was the, the meth kingpin and the, of, and of the, the Cherry Hill Gambinos, he was, right. and the Black Brotherhood. He, he was getting drug money left and right, so, and uh, probably uh, Riccobini too, right? Yeah. They were dealing drugs. Yeah, huge. So, huge. so he was getting drug profits left yeah. and right. So Caponegro um, consolidates a, a, a group of dissidents, and they launch an offensive. They murder Bruno, thinking that they have the backing of the Genovese crime family. In reality, they didn't. Yeah. Uh, and the doers, the most of the conspirators, 
there was a couple exceptions that we'll get to and that ties into our story, are murdered as punishment for killing Bruno. Capa Negro is called to New York City for a meeting that he's told that he's going to be anointed the new Don and in reality he's brutally murdered. Um, and then uh, his, his corpse desecrated uh, with uh, various... Um, uh, stick thing, money up his ass yeah, or something Yeah, things like in his orifices. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was very gruesome. Uh, and two people that were involved in the conspiracy that were able to get passes. And yes, they were involved in the, at the lower end of the conspiracy. One being John Stampa, yeah. who was driving the car and had lowered the window. Uh, it, it was in the was in the driver's seat. Bruno's in the passenger seat. Bruno wants to light a, 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 a light a cigarette, and John Stampa. If, if you subscribe to the fact that he was in on the conspiracy, which I I believe is pretty factual, uh, knew that Capa Negro was coming up with a shotgun. And uh, lowered the, the the window of the passenger side to allow the shotgun to get right up next to Angelo Bruno's head and, and blast away. And they think it Caponegro was such a psycho that even though he was the conciliary of the family, he wanted to carry out the hit himself. Yeah, that's unusual for a high ranking guy like that to, to get his hands dirty. But let me ask you something. I, I know we're digressing a little bit, but it does build up this sort of character study of Stanfa. What's in it for Stanford to uh, to conspire with these guys? Because Stanford is a Gambino guy, and we know Angelo Bruno is the most loyal Gambino ally. But so, Gambino's dead at that point. Castellano's the boss. But but Castellano was on good terms with Bruno too, though. Like more, yeah. way more so. So like, it just seems like Stanford. Um, it just I find it unusual that a Gambino guy would conspire to take out a Gambino ally. I bet if that makes sense. I bet Tony Caponegro was promising Stanfa he was gonna be a capo. Fast track to, that yeah. he would be a capo yeah. in, in the Tony Caponegro regime of the eighties that I never see. that never happened. Yeah, so he if he's thinking whatever loyalties he has to the Gambinos, the Gambinos aren't gonna fast track him to where he wants to be, whereas bananas is probably yeah. offering him whatever. That makes sense. So because Stanford has these ties to New York, and even though it's acknowledged pretty much by both sides of this uh, conflict that Stanford had been involved, he's given a free pass. He goes into hiding. I believe he was uh, in Maryland uh, hiding, uh, dodging uh, subpoenas. Eventually, he goes to prison for five, four, five, six years. Um for 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 contempt, and he reemerges in the late eighties, uh, eventually to take over the family with the blessing of the Gambinos and Genovese. One of Stanford's co-conspirators and Campanegro's co-conspirators was a guy named Little Felix Bacchino, and Little Felix was a Bruno. He wasn't a soldier; he hadn't been made yet. A uh, Bruno associate that. Um, Ran a lot of the Jersey gambling operations for the for the Bruno Scarfo crime family, and even though he was involved in the conspiracy and actually had delivered, according to a testimony from informants, Bacchino's job was deliver. Bacchino's job was to deliver the murder weapon um, to the shooter, hmm. and. For whatever reason, and I have not been able to get a, a clear answer on this, but uh, Bacchino was was spared, uh, and the new Testa and subsequently Scarfo regimes um, embraced Little Felix, and Little uh, Little Nicky Scarfo actually made Felix in into the Philly mob, I believe, in eighty two. Um, little Felix goes to prison uh, for a tax evasion. He comes out in the late 80s and, and links up with Stanfa. And they get the okay from, from the Genovese and the Gambinos to, to take over the family. Stanfa is the boss. Bacchino was never officially named underboss, but it was understood at that time that he was Stanfa's number two, um, his, his street boss, his uh, guy that was speaking on Stanfa's behalf 
um, when he was doing his, his shakedowns to get everyone in line under the new Stanford regime. One of the guys, and th this is the part, and we digress for about 10 minutes, and I, I, <laughs> I was saying how I like to try to find these entry points oh, that's good. that uh, may, people maybe don't know, even though they know the, the narrative, uh, and the narrative has been explored, you know, pretty extensively over the years, some great books, uh, George Anastasia's uh, The Last Gangster and The Goodfellow Tapes are the best at uh, yeah. giving you a deep dive on this mob war. Does anyone talk to Stanford like George? Does he does he talk to anyone from prison? Like right, you know, he's guys in, like Stanford's in prison. With... Um, I don't know if he's in talks with anyone on the outside. I know that he, just like everybody, once on COVID hit, he uh, appealed to oh, his judge for a, a medical course. compassion. Or, you know, didn't go anywhere. He's like ninety two right now. I think. Oh, that's he's really, really he's old. old. He's got to be one of the older uh, inmates in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I, I just. In some ways, I think he's just as fascinating as, as any of these other guys because he's fascinating. We don't, his, we don't know a lot about just, him. And he's mysterious and, he, That's what and I mean. he's dysfunctional. He's, he's mysterious, yeah. So he's got an interesting combination, mysterious and dysfunctional, I agree. But it's it makes it really intriguing. So as Stamp is taking over in 1990, 91, and sending little Felix Bacchino on this kind of this street campaign to get all the bookies and loan sharks and drug dealers uh, in line uh, kicking up a tribute, he starts extorting, or Little Felix and John Stanford begin extorting a guy by the name of Michael Sheiky Baldino. Now, it's a name most people probably have never heard of, and uh, but he has a very valuable bloodline. <laughs> And that is that uh, via uh, Joey Merlino's mother's side, Shiki Baldino is Joey Merlino's uncle. And uh, so he's brother in laws with. He would be brother. He would have been brother in laws with Chucky and Yogi. Yogi, right. Who okay. were uh, Joey's dad and uncle who were big shots in the Scarfo regime and had gone to prison um, with Scarfo in the late 80s. Yogi flipped. Chucky uh, uh, kept his mouth, sh uh, mouth shut and, and went into prison. He was Scarfo's underboss. And at the same time that Stampha is taking over, really, I would say, actually, my research tells me a good year or two before Stampha was taking over, as, as early as 1987, 1988, Joey Molino and his best friend, Mikey Cangolini, whose dad, Chicky Changolini, was also a part of, of the Scarfo administration and was in prison. They had decided, even though they were 27, 28 years old, they decided they were going to take over the city and replace their dads and their uncles. Uh, this was before New York had come in and had named Stanford the boss. This is when Scarfo was still trying to puppet from behind bars and had his uncle, Tony Buck Piccolo, in, in the boss's seat as an acting. And... You know, I, I was able to get my hands on some FBI uh, documents from, you know, like I said, as far back as late 1987, um, which was about six months after the Scarfo regime was decimated. And Joey and Mikey Chang are approaching people saying, it's our time now. Now, it took them five years. Uh, but they, they eventually reached a point where they went to the mattress. So... Joey Merlino's uncle is being extorted by Little Felix and John Stanfa. At the same time, Joey Merlino is being sent to prison for a short sentence on a uh, armored car heist that he had participated in and walked away with uh, maybe half a million dollars, maybe a quarter million dollars, and uh, stole, basically stole it from the guys that had stolen. He had guys go out and steal the money. He took the money from the guys that stole it and never paid them. Who was this? Joy Merlino. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the guys that Merlino had steal the money from the bank, and then Merlino decided to stiff, you know, made a deal and cooperated with the government. Joey had to go do, uh, I think it was three years that he did about two years of. And it just so happens that he gets placed in a federal correctional facility with Ralph Natale, who was a Angelo Bruno uh, confidant and uh, lieutenant, 
was a hitman, was drug a big dealer, labor racketeer. Hitman, drug dealer, labor racketeer. Had worked very closely with with Bruno in the sixties and seventies. Had been sent to uh, federal prison in the late seventies uh, for arson and drug dealing, and had an out date of uh, nineteen ninety four. This would have been nineteen eighty nine or nineteen ninety. And both Merlino and Stampha, oh, sorry, both Merlino and Natali see each other at this kind of meeting of the minds in a prison cell. Uh, Joey gets assigned to Ralph's uh, cell. They're cellmates. They're both from Philadelphia. They had never really met before. Ralph had been in prison since Joey had been 16 or 17. And Did Ralph even fuck with his dad and uncle that much? Yeah, even? Ralph Ralph knew Chucky. He knew and Chucky, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and and Joey sees Ralph as a way to be taken seriously in his desire or his plan to take over the Philly Mafia because Ralph is a old he's an OG and in prison Ralph had made and then out, and when he was out on uh, on the streets in the sixties and seventies Ralph had uh, deep connections in New York yeah and when Joey and Mikey Chang were going around trying to take over the family in the late eighties the New York guys were laughing at him. Uh, so he sees Ralph as someone that can vouch for him with the New York guys. And Ralph, who had always been a minor player, I mean, he was a a minor player in the, in the, in the realm of the organization. Within Bruno's orbit, I think he was a relatively big deal. He, was, he spoke for Bruno in, in the labor rackets, which was uh, something that was, in, was critical. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of the... Bruno Scarfo crime family, Ralph Natale was a non-entity. And he sees Joey Merlino and all of Joey Merlino's boys that are all 28, 29, 30. They all come from a Omerta pedigree. They all are chomping at the bit to, to take their piece of the pie. And there's animosity between Stampha and Natali and Bo or there's animosity between Natali towards Bacchino and Stampha for killing Bruno, who he was very close with. And he sees that the, the Merlino crew as a, a, as a group that he can ride to the top of the Philly Mafia. So they come to this understanding in prison in 1990, 91, as Stampha's regime is getting off the ground, Merlino and Natali make a pact to oppose him. What's really remarkable, I think, about this is, remember, at this time, correct me if I'm wrong, Joey and Ralph, neither one of them are made guys. Right. So we're not talking about a captain and a street boss or something like that. I mean, this is this is another layer of, of yeah. what makes this so exceptional. Right. right. <laughs> Like two guys, and right, Joey's got some street cred. Natalie, he's got people know who he is. He's an OG, but they still don't have their yeah. buttons. Neither one of them, I don't believe. So, Natalie claims he did, but I don't think that's no. He never did. That's that, he, he then. That's if that was bullshit, true, right? if that was true, then he perjured himself under oath. Yeah, yeah. Right. In his book, that full disclosure, I had a uh, a part in early on uh, in Ralph Natalie's book. I left the project because of this very thing. Um, you know, under oath in, in tr at trial, he said he was made in the 90s by Joey. Right. But in his book, he talks about secretly being made in the 60s by Bruno and, and Gambino. And, yeah. And that's just not true. Uh, so. It just shows you again how audacious these two guys are. Yeah. That neither one of them are <laughs> made guys and they're plotting. But it also shows you the disarray of the official Borgata that these two could even, that this would even be yeah. just fantasy. Possible. That or, this was even possible. Or plausible. Well, that it was even plausible was what shows you the state of the family. Because otherwise you'd be like, this is just fantasy. But it also shows you the force of nature Joey Merlino is. That at, at 28, 29, he could rally, you know, two, three dozen guys yeah. uh, that were all capable yeah. Um, and that would get behind him yeah, true for what might look like a suicide mission. That's right. Yeah. A lot of guys would have been like, are you fucking yeah. crazy? Like, right. No. We ain't doing that. But to Joey's credit, you know, he wasn't someone who talked the talk and had other people walk the walk for him. He was someone yeah. that was like, we're going to war and I'm going to be in the foxhole with you and I'm going to be leading the battalion as we go up to take the hill. Yeah. He seemed fearless. 
Uh, so Merlino and Natalie really, it was before 92. 92 is the, you know, we're, we're talking about the 30 year uh, anniversary of this war. Um, it wasn't related really to Stanfa Merlino conflict, but in 1990, right when Joey got into prison, uh, him and Natalie conspired to murder uh, an organized crime figure in Philadelphia named Louis Irish DeLuca, who wasn't paying them street tax because he didn't recognize them, and they wanted to send a message. Um, and this is right before Stanford took over, so Stanford wasn't, I don't think, cutting into them at I don't think Stanford was cutting into DeLuca. So I don't think it was like DeLuca was paying Stanford and not paying Merlino. It was right. just, he wasn't paying Merlino. So Natalie encouraged Joey and these guys on the street to, to whack him out. Joey was in prison at, when, the, when the hit happened. But Louis Irish's, I know, we're, again, we're throwing out a lot of names, so I apologize and try to bear with us. Louis Irish had a protege uh, who, unlike Joey, all of Joey's main guys were all guys that had dads and uncles and cousins that were Philadelphia mobsters in the Bruno and then the Scarfo regime. There emerged a major figure in the Merlino camp that didn't have that pedigree, but eventually rose to be Joey's number two, his underboss. And, he is on, and he's Joey's underboss, if you believe the federal government, today in 2022. His name is Stevie Mazzone. They call him Handsome Stevie. Uh, very good looking. A lot of swagger, just like uh, uh, like Joey Merlino. Um, very capable. Uh, very very savvy. Um, and Stevie had nothing to do with Louis DeLuca being murdered. That came from Merlino and Natale. And, and Stevie Mazzone has never been implicated in that. But he had a tie to DeLuca. DeLuca was really the first body to drop, but I wouldn't consider it the body that led to the war. Now, you fast forward to 1992, and or the, let's say, let's fast forward to the end of 91, and Joey is getting out of prison and going back to the streets with this plan that him and Natalia had, had hatched. And the first order of business for Joey is to get his uncle out of this extortion plan or this extortion um, this this extortion play, yeah, if you will. Baldino's being shaken. Yeah, down Shiki by. Baldino's being shaken down by Little Felix and, and and John Stanfa, and Joey arranges for Ralph, or Joey tips Ralph off to where Little Felix is going to be at a Christmas party in '91. It's going to be at a, a I think a bar in Jersey. Ralph from prison knows the guy that owns the bar, calls the bar, and actually gets little Felix on the phone and says, you know, hey, Felix, you know, we haven't spoken in 12, 13 years. I hope you're doing all right. But you got to understand what the situation is right now. I'm getting behind, you know, Joey and Mikey Chang and these guys and I don't know what you're, what's going on with you and Stanford, but whatever's going on with you and Stanford, you got to keep your hands off of Shiki, who's Joey's uncle. And Felix, for all intents and purposes, told Ralph to go fly a kite and go fuck himself. Well, yeah, because you can't t- a non-made guy right. can't tell a made guy who to who to shake down. And I mean, he pretty much hung. He pretty much hung up on traditional Ralph. protocol is right. he, he has no right to to talk to him like that. He says uh, he he hangs up on him, but before he hangs up on him. He says, hey, man, we're not telling you. He, he, he makes a, a – he, he uses the term green light, and he, and he says, hey, man, we're not telling you what you can or cannot do. This was kind of before – this was as Stanford's um, power is growing. But at that point, Stanford wasn't trying to have Joey and Mikey Chang kick up to him. Stanford was saying – Hey, whatever you're doing, you can do. Stay out of my Stay way. Stay out of my way. Right. So little Felix tells Ralph, hey, man, listen, you guys got the green light to do whatever the fuck you want to do. Stay out of our business. Then he, then he hung up. Uh, and, you know, uh, three weeks later or less than a month later, uh, little Felix is murdered in front of his 
uh, his home in South Philly. Uh, it was an early morning hit that was pulled off by a, a, a single trigger man. And Ralph Natale, when he eventually cut a cooperation deal, and this was the, the Boccaccino hit, lights the fuse that turns into the two-year war between Stanford and Merlino, and you have over half a dozen bodies. Um, just, the, you know, it, it captured the, the, the headlines in oh, Philadelphia, on the, uh, on the television set, uh, in the newspapers for, for uh, a good two years, it, and it, it really pushed Joey Merlino into the national conversation of, of America and the Cosa Nostra. Yeah, because at that time... Uh, this was before game tax. So Detroit wasn't – the Detroit fam, familia wasn't really in the news a lot. So for me, visiting family in South Jersey, it was it was a real contrast to read about an ongoing shooting mafia war as opposed to Detroit where e- even even within the Italian-American community, we all – you all know Toco, Giacalone's really, but – They're not killing each other. They're not, they're not killing each other. Yeah. Uh, so the Little Felix murder in, on January 29th, 1992, um, allows for this boiling, festering rivalry between Natali and Merlino uh, against Stampha and <laughs> formerly Little Felix uh, to, to really break out into the open. And uh, it, it was, you know, two years of bloodshed and bodies dropping. And it 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 propelled Joey Merlino into the national conversation when you're talking about the mafia in America. And, and he went from a local brand to a national brand. I think it wasn't 92, but within a couple of years, I remember uh, 2020 came in and uh, did something when he was doing a, one of his famous uh, Al Capone turkey giveaways. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it all started with this January 1992 Little Felix hit, and we're on the 30th anniversary of that war. Uh, 92 was a was a it was the year that started it, but by the end of the year, things had actually tamped down. Um, they came to a detente for a while. Yeah, briefly, so, right? So in 92, January 92, they killed Little Felix. There were some attempts on Joey's life and on Mikey Chang's life uh, throughout ninety, the you know early part of ninety two. Um, by the fall of ninety two, there is a ceasefire, uh, a very very temporary meeting of the minds, I guess, where Stanfa felt like he could nip this problem in the bud by bringing. Joey Merlino and Mikey Chang closer to him. I, I feel like the whole time it was just a plot to bring them close so he could kill them. And they but, suspected that. But ostensibly it was a, a plot for everyone to kind of make nice. And uh, we'll, get their buttons, we'll right? induct you. Joey and Mikey, we, uh, John Stanford says, I will make you. And you kind of, you guys kind of have your own little faction of the, of the family, and we all kind of, you know, let bygones be bygones. Um, that only lasted a couple months. Uh, one of the other things that Stanford did as a, uh, a kind of an olive branch gesture was to name Mikey Chang's older brother, Joey Chang, as his underboss. Now, on its face, it seems like a great idea. I'm going to name one of your people, meaning Joey and Changalini's people, as my number two in the whole family. But and he had just not, been made to go right from being made to yeah, boss. Joey had been, I think Joey had been made uh, either in ninety one, right when, mm. right when Stanford got okay. in, he made Joey Chang. Uh, and uh, what if you know the backstory? And obviously Stanford didn't. Joey Chang and Mikey Chang hated each other. So having Joey come on board with Stampha, all it did really was drive a wedge further between the groups as opposed to bringing the groups together, which it looked like 
you know, on the surface. So, you know, within uh, a couple months, Joey Chang uh, is almost killed in the first ever mafia hit to be caught on camera. Uh, March 93 at a uh, diner that Joey Chang ran uh, in an industrial area of, of Philadelphia that I think Stanford had a headquarters in. And uh, he was there, you know, was, he was the type of gangster that didn't sleep till 12 o'clock in the, um, in the afternoon. He was up at four or five in the morning mm -hmm. and working that, uh, the, managing this diner. And uh, the Merlino camp knew this. And uh, if you believe certain informants in that camp and certain intelligence Reports that have come out from that incident in March of 93, uh, Mikey Chang was the shooter. Um, his own brother. Was, was trying to kill his own brother. And uh, his brother almost was almost died, but uh, survived it. But he was handicapped for the rest of his life, put on the shelf, could no longer really function as an organized crime figure. And Mikey Chang was proud of it. Uh, now, what led to that was a incident months before that where Mikey and, and w really where the the ceasefire fell apart was a couple months before the Joey Chang attempted hit. Mikey Chang, who was uh, you know a quintessential neighborhood guy, uh, a lot of people say you know as, as, as fearless as Joey Merlino is, Mikey Chang was ten times more fearless, more fearless. Um, some people even claim that it was really Mikey Chang leading this young group mm. more than Joey was. Yeah. And Joey was kind of the, the fate that was the front man. Sure. Sure. Um, so Mikey Chang, everything, you know, everyone I've spoke to that knew him personally, and you know, the guy was just a real, uh, force of nature, uh, of a, of a human being in, in multiple be, ways. There could be truth to that. I mean, sometimes yeah. you get a perfect storm of two, yeah. you think of like Toto Reina and Provenzano in, in Corleone. You really, it really has to be. But Tortorina is the face. Yeah. Everyone knows him, and they're f afraid of him. But we know that Provenzano, b behind the scenes, is is very much part of that. It's a one-two so, combination. Yeah. So Mikey Chang's coming back from. This is a couple months after. Uh, I believe a couple months after Mikey and Joey are made. Um, Mikey is coming back from a basketball game. He would play. Uh, uh, in, during the spring and summertime, there was a, a game that was at a local park. They'd play every like Thursday night. And uh, Mikey Chang was was coming back. Uh, had just played basketball for two hours, was headed back to his house. And when he got to his house, two men with shotguns, you know, blast out of a, the bushes in a car and, and start shooting at him in front of his wife and kids. And you know, God forbid, uh, uh, one of those shots goes into the front window and kill, you know, kills one of his daughters or, you know, it was very, it was a very personal hit that, that really uh, didn't take any, anyone's safety into account. No, they didn't, they didn't lure him to like some, right. uh, the back of some factory. And, and Mikey Chang swore that he saw Joey Chang's face, that one of the two guys that was shooting at him and shooting into his house where his wife and kids were what was his own brother. So that's how bitter this got. This is how Shakespearean this conflict got. How was the old man? Wasn't the old man trying to? So, right. So there's, and that's another thing. Some of this right. Like... So let's, let's clear up some of that. And I think there's been some misconstruing of what Chicky Changolini from behind bars was or wasn't advising. And, uh, this is another kind of entry point that I don't know if a lot of people know, but I want people to know. Chicky Changolini was not backing Mikey Chang and Joey Merlino's palace coup. And I think that narrative has made it out that Chucky Merlino and Chicky Changolini, mm -hmm. yeah. Mikey and Joey's dads, yeah. who were you know, kind of a semi-tandem on the outside back in the 70s and 80s, that they were coaching Right. From behind bars, Joey and Mikey on how to take the family over. And I can't speak for what Chucky Merlino was telling Joey, but I think I can speak for what was coming from prison from Chicky to his two sons at that time that were both 
uh, fighting in this war on, or on we're opposite sides. And, and Chicky was, was telling Mikey and Joey to stand down. Yeah. He was saying, this is you kind of like what we, we talked about in uh, with Gotti and, and De La Croce. And you saw it in the, oh, yeah, in the yeah. movie Gotti. Right. Yeah, right. You don't have to like who's your boss. Yeah. But La Cosa Nostra. Boss. No, La Cosa Nostra <laughs> is La Cosa Nostra. And right. That this is the system. The system that was in place before you will be in place after you, and you have to respect the system. Yeah. And, and Chicky was saying, you know, uh, remember he stop. Says, he says uh, Asante says to his guy, he says, "Are you okay with that?" He's like, it "Doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> right. matter if I'm okay with this. Like that's this is how this is how it works." So Chicky it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> Chicky was telling them to, even if you don't keep kicking up to to stand for. Uh, in that regime, you have to stop shooting at them. Yeah. Uh, and Mikey Chang was not listening to what his father said. Wow. The brother, the 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 middle brother, Johnny Chang, who's still around and is an active member of the of the crime family, has been acting under boss Capo regime. He got caught on a wire talking about how he was smack dab in the middle of this. He was neutral, right? He was well. He was in prison too. Yeah. So right. he couldn't okay. have taken a side, but he was okay. he was calling both brothers in early '93, late '92, saying, "Just wait till I get home. I'll That's be right. home in a year, and I will solve this. I will fix this. You two are brothers. Stop trying to kill each other. Just wait for me to get home." And uh, you know, was lamenting his brother Mike, saying, "I love the kid." You know, he had my heart, but he was one hard-headed bastard that wouldn't listen to one word I said <laughs> yeah. and was convinced that our other brother was trying to kill him, so he was going to retaliate. Right. Now, this this all happened, um, the, the, the murder that was, or the attempted murder that was caught on camera was March of 93. August of 93, Mikey Chang is murdered, um, not by Joey Chang, but by Triggerman sent by John Stanfa. Uh, they were in a, you know, at that point was the, the height of the shooting war and Joey and uh, Mikey Chang and their guys had rented a storefront to be their um, war room, if you will. It was an old uh, Greenpeace uh, building mm -hmm. and it became their clubhouse, their hangout. And you got to, I mean, if you think of the, uh, the guy, uh, well, think of the Godfather. Yes, the Godfather and think of. Sopranos, like when there's a mob war going on, you can't you can't go about your daily no, activities. That's the mattresses, you right? The mattresses. You, you, yeah, right. That's where the term comes from. <laughs> right. You know, you need to, you to hide out, bunker down. <laughs> yeah, right. So none of these guys were going home because each hit teams on both sides were patrolling the neighborhoods uh, for 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 targets. And Joey and Mikey felt safe uh, at at this clubhouse. And it was early August, 1993. It was a real hot day. And Mikey and Joey, uh, realizing that the clubhouse was most likely bugged, uh, went outside to have a walk and talk. And I think they were going across the street to grab something at the local liquor store, like a Coke or a lottery ticket. And Stanford's, uh shooters saw them and you know ripped off uh, some shots from a passing vehicle. Joey was hit in the back and in the butt. Mikey only got caught once, but uh, it went right through his heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died in Joey's arms. I mean, that, I mean, that's something, something out of him. Yeah, I, I was there. I was in South Jersey. I remember the, and the images of the funeral with Joey with the cane and yeah. all that. I remember it was on TV. It was in the newspaper. So he died in Joey's arms. I mean, according to Joey, uh, who was caught on a wiretap discussing the last moments of Mikey Chang, uh, you know, Mikey Chang looked up to Joey and, and said, I'm dying here. Like, uh, it's bad. Mm -hmm. and, and Joey talked about how when they both went down at first, he didn't think, oh, he's fine. He's, I don't see blood. And then he right. turns him over and realizes that he's, that he's dying out right there in front of him. And then as Jimmy said, uh, the funeral uh, was all over the news. Joey was in the hospital for a couple of days, comes out, you know, with, with a cane is one of the pallbearers. Um, Stevie Mazzone is is one of the pallbearers. So let's try to tie this all together here and, and wrap it up in the next 10 minutes. Stevie Mazzone was considered the top suspect in 
the Felix Bakchino hit. Um, he was never charged. And uh, when Mikey Chang died, Stevie Mazzone became Joey's right hand. Mikey Chang had been Joey's right hand. And uh, Stevie took Joey's, or sorry, Stevie took Mikey's place next to Joey. And really the triumvirate since that August 1993 assassination has been Joey, handsome Stevie Mazzone as the number two, and Georgie Boy Borghese as the number three, the, the conciliary. Um, right now, my sources tell me that uh, Georgie is actually the acting boss, and uh, Joey is you know living down in Florida. Stevie's about to go to prison. Uh, just got caught up in another racketeering case in the last couple of years. Uh, he'll be sentenced in the first week of November, looking at six or seven years. And, uh, you know, just like Joey and Georgie, they beat a bunch of murder cases when Ralph eventually flipped. Ralph uh, came out of prison in 94. Stanford goes into prison in 94, which pretty much ends the war. Um, a couple months after Stanford goes in, Natalie comes out. First time in 15 years. Joey and his boys see this as a perfect opportunity to just put Ralph in place as a lightning rod, as a front boss. Let Ralph think that he's he's Don Corleone when, as, as George Anastasia has always uh, analogized, make him think he's Don Corleone. In reality, he's Uncle Junior. Or Fredo. Or Fredo. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, that generation gap wore really thin between the guys that were in their 30s and then Ralph, who was in his 60s, trying to rediscover his 30s. Right. Um, Ralph uh, was, you know, he was 60 going on 25, took a girlfriend that was one of Joey and his guys' you know, childhood friends that Ralph wanted them to then start treating like she was Princess Di. And they were just like, hey, man, it's Ruthie. And he, don't call her Ruthie. It's Ruth Ann now. And they're like, it's been Ruthie since we were in elementary school. It's Ruthie now. Like, don't tell me what I should be able to call my... Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my childhood friend. And, and that was, you know, kind of the tip of the iceberg. And uh, Ralph was a um, very boastful, was a, like, was more like a, a football coach than a mafia boss. He would hold these, these like pep rallies and, and get everyone all riled up and <laughs> excited, all this rah rah, siskumba. And then really at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, Ralph Natale was just a drug dealer. He couldn't do any of the things that he was telling people he could do right. or that they should do and that he was going to take over the city and get involved in all this political yeah. and go, you know government police corruption that he was able to that he thought he was going to be able to get to benefit the family. It wasn't the 1970s anymore. Right. He didn't seem to appreciate He couldn't that. put anything together. <laughs> right. He he talked this huge game and all of his deals kind of died on the vine and he made all of his money via Drug dealing. I mean, that's how he made his money in the seventies, and then when he had no no way out, no way else to make money in the nineties, he went to his uh, son in laws, and uh, they they started you know selling meth again, and that's how he was able to um, keep himself you know in the life that he felt accustomed to. In addition to the whatever tribute he was he was getting made, but eventually that those tribute checks stopped coming because Joey and his guys. Well, by by early ninety eight. White Android phone charger in here. Uh, nope, that's not oh. what I'm looking for. Thanks. That's all right. Do you think if do you think if Natalie doesn't get busted that they kill Malinos him? Malinos and guys take kill him. him. Out? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm at. Read, I think if if Natalie got picked up on a parole violation in June of ninety eight. Yeah, I think if he would have stayed on the street, he probably would have been dead by Christmas. Or if not by Christmas, you know, by the new millennium. Yeah. Um, and the second he got in there, he was angling for a deal. He didn't make the deal till the fall of 99. So it was like almost a year and a half later. But he was making overtures to the government. He wanted to, you know, flip on Joey, felt betrayed. But Joey and Stevie and, and Georgie, you know, uh, remain at the, at the forefront of that family today. 
they all were indicted based on uh, based on a lot on on Ralph's. Um, well, I shouldn't say they were indicted based on. They went to trial. Ralph was a star witness at that trial. They were indicted on a, a bunch of other things uh, that had happened before Ralph flipped, uh, mainly the cooperation of Ron Previty. Who was a Stanford guy. And then, a Stanford and then guy jumped over. Who jumped over by basically waving a bunch of cash in, in Joey's face. Right. And saying, I know that I was on the side of the, the mob that was trying to kill you these last couple of years, but I can be a benefit to you if you let me come on board. Right. And the reason why he was such a big earner is because the feds, the feds were paying were, for <laughs> The feds <laughs> paid this guy. This guy was on the payroll, I right. think, for three years. Yeah. And he got paid well over a million dollars. Yeah. Back in the nineties, that's a, that's a that's another. It's not as bad as the Bulger thing, but yeah. it's bad. Yeah, that, that was that was, and he was a gangster that whole time. Yeah, and they were paying, giving him. And money. he was. How about the fact that he started off as a cop? Yeah, yeah he should have never been made right. in the first place. Stanford made him right. right? Yeah, and he shouldn't have. Right, which is ironic for Stanford being the I'm the old school Siciliano. Like, like but it came down to the same that, thing. That, that's a that's a rule that goes back to Palermo, back to yeah. the 1800s. That you don't make a guy who's a cop. But it also it comes down to this. You know, the, the, one of the oldest adages in the book when you're talking about the mafia, green talks, man. <laughs> right. Like if you're someone right. and, and you're coming up to the to the Don or your capo or whoever, and every week you're handing them a, a, a envelope that's stacked with hundred dollar bills, and it's and you know what, and the and the 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 the, the superior never has to tell the subordinate. Hey, I'm, I'm looking for my money. I'm waiting for my money. It's just the subordinate is just always coming up to him yeah, they and giving him envelopes. They can't resist it. Well, you're going to get on that guy's good side yeah. real fast. Yeah, they and can't. any any suspicions yeah. uh, are going to be blinded by the desire to keep getting that envelope every. No, I, we've, week. I've read about these examples. Not only the Italian. You don't pay three times. Last right. Year. No, that's right. right. No, it's exa that's it's right. exactly what happened that's in right. The Sopranos. Right. Tony was hesitant to to cut ties with Vito because was Vito was making him a lot of money. Right. And. Uh, the um, we've had shameless self promotion. We had an episode with Carrie Drogan, who wrote a book about the Hell's Angels and the Jay Dobbins case. And there's rank and file Hell's Angels who are starting to suspect he's he's a cop, and they tell the the president that. And as soon as the president starts to get suspicious, Dobbins comes home with a big or comes back with a bigger envelope. And each time the president says, ah, this guy's all right. This guy's all right. Meanwhile, the yeah, money is coming from Uncle Sam. <laughs> the money's coming from Uncle Sam, right. But they can't re they can't resist the, the big envelope. They so, can't, but it's it's with the Italians, too. I mean, isn't that what happened with Gigante? Yeah. With that guy who was an associate, right, who, who ended up flipping on him? Um, because uh, he was an earner, yeah. right? They can't they can't resist. So, but, but we're sitting here, and then let's kind of wrap it up here. You know, 30 years later... Joey, Stevie, and Georgie are running the Philadelphia Mafia, allegedly. Uh, there they, is no mafia. They are living their best lives. And you can follow these guys on social media. Uh, they are the... Go Phillies. They, they have it. They are, they are, from what I can uh, understand, <laughs> they are traveling right now <laughs> with the Phillies, going to all the World Series games, going to all the playoff games. There's like a group of them. Um, that have been uh, during the playoffs. They were flying out to San Diego, um, yeah. And now I'm sure they'll be uh, descending on on Houston. So these guys are, and you gotta you gotta understand if you're not, and I'm not from Philadelphia, but I I make Philadelphia part of my my coverage. And uh, if you're not from there and you don't know about it, it's hard to grasp the way that the mob family in Philadelphia is covered by the press. It's different oh, than yeah. Chicago. It's different than New York. 100%. It's much different than Detroit. Oh. They cover yeah. the Philadelphia press, the mainstream press, covers the Philadelphia mob family as if they're a sporting organization. Yeah. As if they're covering the 76ers or the Eagles yeah. or the Phillies. They'll ask them for a quote. Go yeah. right up to them and ask them for a so, quote. So <laughs> it's not crazy to think that these guys that are like the equivalent of professional athletes are running around following the professional athletes. And and we know that... Plus with, a lot of money on those games. Right. And we know with Joey, at least, uh, you know, back in the day, he was running around with Eric Lindros, was his buddy. Oh, yeah. He was dating, allegedly, he was dating Eric Lindros' sister. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, And there's always been a lot of uh, a crossover. Well, Joey loves sports. Everyone yeah. knows that. Like, yeah. he's a big jock. Yeah. Like, and he bets, he bets heavy on his teams. Yeah. So, like, when, Phil, uh, when Villanova... Won the uh, uh, NCAA basketball a couple years ago. 
made a fortune because his daughters all went to Villanova and he wanted to bet Villanova and he's a Philly guy. And I've heard he's been betting huge on the Eagles, betting huge on the Phillies. Well, it's a good time More to power be a to Philadelphia him. fan. I don't know how the Flyers or 76 are doing, but the Eagles and the Phillies are. So, you know, they, so the 30 right. years later, these guys, uh, these guys really had the last laugh. And I'll, I'll conclude with there's been all of these rumors. I mean, 20 years of rumors about how these murders from the 90s are going to come back and bite Joey and his guys. All these murders from the from the uh, Stanfa uh, Merlino War, and then murders that took place in the late '90s and early 2000s. Tying uh, up loose uh, ends under under what do you say? <laughs> tying up loose ends. Right, tying up some <laughs> loose ends. Joe Legambi, who uh, is the conciliary now, de facto conciliary, along with Chicky Changalini, who's out now and uh, kind of advising a little bit. I've heard. That there's still lingering animosity between Chicky Changalini and Joey Merlino mm. for what happened the brother, between the in brothers. the 90s. That Chicky doesn't think finally of Joey and blames Joey for what happened to his he's, two sons. How old is he now? He's, Chicky's in the 90s. I was going to say, wow. Pushing 90. And so guys like, they call him Uncle Joe, right? Joe no, Legambi? They called. Joe Legambi, Uncle Joe, and they called Joe Chinkalini. So was Chicky. he was he made by Scarfo or was he made by Stamfa? Le, Joe Legambi was made by Scarfo. Okay, so there were Scarfo guys during this who were who were out on the streets because a lot of those guys either got well, clipped or they went to prison. But so there were some Scarfo guys who just kept their head down no, and didn't like Le, Legambi was in prison. Okay, so he was in prison. He came out in ninety seven when he got his murder conviction toss so okay he did 10 years with the scarf oh, okay guys. so were there any scarf guys on no. the street that kept but he but but, but legambi came out and then became that kind of bridge that, i see that or that they they bridged the key bridge the gap between the older and the yeah. younger right between scarfo and merlino which was which was good because as as audacious and bold and fearless as merlino and those guys were i i have to think that that was smart. Legambi is one of the most underrated yeah, that's, mafia that's dons I mean. in American history. He gets no love because he's so quiet, he's so yeah. understated, but he came in after all of this stuff that we're, we talked about for the last hour. All of this bloodshed and dysfunction and this Shakespearean duplicity and everybody goes to prison and the family is decimated and Legambi is walking out of prison at that point and as a guy that I've always kind of analogize him to like a Patsy Parisi in terms of like, he was never a major player in the Scarfo regime. He was a guy that everyone liked and recognized as a great handicapper. Um, and someone who was capable because he allegedly had taken place in a murder, taken part in a murder. But I, I, there's some revisionist history now where I've heard some people say, Oh, I, people predicted in, you know, in the early to mid eighties that Joe Legambi would be a, you know, a great leader. Oh, I don't know if that's yeah, true. Yeah, right. But so the Joel Gambi comes out of prison in 97. He was this very minor player in the Scarfa regime. And not only does he take the family over, he stabilizes it. Right. He gains the respect, again, of the New York families. He gets everybody on the same page. And he basically keeps that family well above water and functioning at a pretty high clip for 20 years. Yeah. And I think that's important because some of those old Scarfo guys – Probably weren't to be trifled with. So when they well, get out, I think it was doing important their, well, to... Well, they're doing their know. own thing now. Yeah. So the and we've talked about this before on the show. I mean, the Philly Mafia right now is is split really like in three different directions. You have the traditional family that Joey runs and his crew runs. And you have Phil Narducci, who's one of those Scarfo guys that came out of prison yeah. and isn't isn't friends with Joey, but does his own thing. I believe there is some... Tribute being passed from from Narducci to Mazzone and Legambi, which keeps him sure able to 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 control that yeah faction within a faction. And then there's some other old school Scarfo guys that are neither under Narducci nor Merlino, and that are kind of doing their own thing. And they and they probably pay. pay I don't them. think I don't think the guy I don't think the the non affiliated Scarfo guys which are led by the Pungitor brothers, um, who I've heard have made tens of millions of dollars and legitimately in real estate rehabbing and flipping. Um, and then they also, I've heard, co-mingle some of that with Listen. gambling and loan sharking and whatnot. Uh, allegedly, 
Uh, I don't think that they really have any affiliation with anybody. And they just keep their head down. Hmm. And, and they're made? And yeah, these are guys that were made in by Scarfo in the early 80s. Philadelphia is such an anomaly. It's just, that's not, that's not like, if you're a made guy, you're supposed the to pick were, up. The Punditors were the best friends of, of Salvi. Oh, and, and, yeah, yeah. And they made the Punditors set Salvi up. He's a guy that some people said could have been boss. No, he would have been. Yeah, he would have been but boss. Salvi that, Testa. That, which is why Scarfo had Right. Salvi, te- Salvi Testa, for people that don't know, was the Joey Merlino before Joey Merlino. And uh, he was murdered uh, in 1984 before he could really spread his wings as a mafia leader. There's but, a lot about that in Mafia Prince. Yeah. A shameless uh, promotion for Bernie. Yes, from my book, <laughs> Mafia Prince, which was written about the uh, Scarfo underboss. Crazy Phil Leonetti. So this was fun. I liked. Uh, I love deep diving this stuff. The nine, you know, the nineties in Philly. That you know, to me, that's my most. If I had to pick one group in one era to study, it would be Philadelphia, early to mid nineties. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow us on social media: Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We've got more content coming on the way. More authors, more underworld people, more just us deep diving some historical stuff. We have a Hollywood director that we're going to be talking to very soon. So, uh, thanks for listening. And go Phillies. Uh, go Phillies. Go Phillies. Um, original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein for Benny. We're out.